Making the right life changes puts you in a better position to fulfill God's plan. This is the second message in the series, Discover. The message is entitled, The Need for Change. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Let's go ahead and dive into this weekend's message as we're involved in a series entitled Discover. And I want to talk this weekend about how to discover something very vital in our lives, how to discover the need for change. And of course, that's going to cause you to begin to perhaps think a little differently in your life today, the need for change. And what does this mean? How does it apply to me? Let's start by uh, just going back to that very first Christmas. We're in this Christmas season. I want to bring you back to the time that Mary and Joseph first had their encounter with God and realized that they were going to be the ones that would bring the Christ child into the world, that Mary, by a virgin, would bring uh, the Christ child into the world, and Joseph would lend support to that process. And they had this amazing encounter with God that very first Christmas. And even to this day, when we think about Christmas, we think about some elements of the mystery of Christmas. When you unwrap, uh, unwrap a Christmas present, you don't really know what it is until you get the box open, the paper's torn off, and you dig in. Well, in many ways, that very first Christmas, Joseph and Mary did not fully understand all that was happening to them and was going to happen to the world, and they had to discover some very vital things in that very first Christmas. And what we're doing in this series together is we're talking about some of those discoveries that Mary and Joseph made in their lives that are actually discoveries that we need to make as well. And one of the critical discoveries that Joseph and Mary discovered in their life, we talked last weekend about the power of the promise. They discovered the power of God's promises in their life, but they also discovered something very significant, the need for change in their lives. And I want to talk to us for a few moments this weekend about this very important discovery, the discovery of learning how to and responding to God's call to change, to be the people that are continually growing in Him and adjusting our lives in ways that will please Him. I'm going to share with you four things that I believe are very essential, four things that you have to embrace as you discover this need for change in your life from the story of Mary and Joseph. First of all, it's vital for us to believe that God's plans are better than our plans. There's a very important statement there that God has a plan for your life and his plan is actually better than your plan. Joseph and Mary, when they first had an encounter with God, had their plans actually changed by God. I want you to take a look with me at this life-changing moment in the life of Mary when she has this encounter with God recorded in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged, notice that phrase, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. When Mary comes on the scene of Scripture, there's this encounter that she has with the angel Gabriel, and she, we encounter her, we, we are introduced to her as a young lady who had some very significant plans for her life. She was engaged to be married to a man by the name of Joseph, and they had their lives planned. They were looking ahead to a future together. They were waiting on the process for their marriage to actually happen and the consummation of that marriage to eventually occur. And they were in this process of engagement. They were waiting for their day, for this moment when their dream of matrimony would come to pass. And here in this moment, there's an angel that appears in Mary's life with a very different kind of plan. And here's this angel that comes in the sixth month. The Bible says it was the six months of Elizabeth, her relative's pregnancy. She was bearing John the Baptist, who would be, later be the, the one that would be the forerunner and, and prepare the way for Messiah. And so God's plan of salvation was already in motion. And this message comes from the angel Gabriel. He's an angelic host. He's known as the messenger angel, oftentimes bringing messages from God to people. And here is this angel showing up in a little town, a little village by the name of Nazareth to a virgin named Mary, to this young lady who's there somewhere between the ages most likely of 14 and 16, 18 years of age, probably no older than that, engaged to be married. And here is this angelic experience that she has with this angelic host. And here's a message that was being given to her. Although she had some plans in her life, God says, I want to make some adjustments to your plans. The situation was going to test something in Mary. It was going to test her trust in God. 
Would she stick to her own plans or would she trust the superiority of God's plans for her life? The choice would be hers because God was not going to force this upon her. He was offering her an opportunity. And to believe God's plans for her life, she had to believe that it was better and she had to move past some obstacles. For her to say yes to God's plan in her life, she would have to trust and believe that God's plans were much better than her own plans. And I want to tell you today that in your life, God has a plan for your life. See, God knows everything about you, just like he knew everything about Mary. He knows everything about you. And God has a unique set of plans for your life. He has designed you. You're not a person that's been designed by God on accident. There is a purpose to your life. And he wants you to understand. He wants you to grasp his plan. See, it's not just that God has a set of plans for you and somehow wants to withhold them from you. No, God wants you to walk in his plans and walk in the the purposes for which he has created you. But here's the challenge. God's plans quite often conflict with our plans. See, we as human beings have the tendency to plan our lives out apart from God, and we have the ideas that we know better for our lives, and oftentimes we don't even consult God in terms of what he would want to do with our lives, and because of that, we lay out our plans, and we fail to take into account that God has a set of plans that he wants to reveal to us, just like he did for Mary. And we have to be very careful to adjust ourselves to the fact that God wants to lead and guide our lives. And and really experiencing the change that we need in our lives starts with trusting God's plan. To come to that place in life where, as Mary did, we are confronted with the reality that God wants to make some adjustments to the way we're living our lives. And those adjustments are always good and they're for our benefit because God's plans are are always better than your plans. Can I encourage you this weekend as you're thinking about the Christmas season to begin to think about the plan that God has for your life and to realize that his plans are far superior than yours. It wasn't as though Mary had bad plans. It was just that God had better plans. And your plans may be good. There may be nothing wrong with your plans, but God always wants to add his dimension to your plan. And and you have to trust and believe that his plans are better than yours. The second thing that we learn from the story of Joseph and Mary and how they discovered the need for change in their life, first of all, God confronts them with this this plan that he has for them, and now they're having to believe that this is going to be good for them. And the second thing that's necessary is that you and I have to make sure that we're becoming the person, that we're preparing for the change that is necessary. We have to become that person who is prepared for change, and Mary was that person. Have you ever wondered why God chose Mary? Have you ever ever wondered that out of all the young ladies in Israel during that time that God came down to that little village in Nazareth and said to Mary, you're the one that I want? I believe that God chose Mary because Mary, God knew some things about Mary that represented her character, her characteristics, how she was going to respond to God. God knowing who she was, knew that she was going to be receptive to the plan that he had for her. And Mary had certain qualities in her life that prepared her to actually become the the bearer of the Christ child and to actually be the one that fulfilled the plan that God had, not just for Mary, but God had, had for the world. Because the plan that God had for Mary wasn't just about Mary. It was beyond Mary. It was for the entire world. And to us, this very day, we're still celebrating the reality that Mary said yes to this great plan because we're the recipients of that salvation that came through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, fully God and fully man. As I was studying this whole idea of Mary's character and Mary's, uh, Mary's thought process and who Mary was as a person and why God chose Mary, there were four characteristics that really came to my mind that I want to remind us of this weekend that will always prepare you to be a recipient of the plan of God. First of all, you realize God has a plan for my life, and his plan is better than my plan, but I need to to be prepared for that plan. So what qualities are going to make you the person who is prepared for whatever God wants to do in your life? And that first quality is something that's very clear in the life of Mary. It's the quality of humility. Mary possessed genuine humility. It's evident by the grace that's upon her life. In fact, the angel Gabriel said, you're highly favored of God. And that word favored represents grace. There's grace upon your life. And the Bible is very clear where grace comes from. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble. 
See, pride and arrogance will always keep us from the best that God has for us. And so had Mary been a prideful person, she would have missed this opportunity that God had for her life. But instead, she had prepared herself by genuine humility. And you and I need to do the same need to humble ourselves under God and say, God, you're, you're wiser than I am, and I don't know, I don't have the wisdom that you do, and to live a life of humility that represents an opportunity for God's grace to flow into our lives. So Mary was ready for God's plans because she was humble. Second of all, there was simplicity in Mary. She was a simple young lady. She had a simple faith. It was not complex. She had a simple confidence in God. You see this as she goes through her encounter with Gabriel. Eventually she says, may it be unto me according to your will, according to your word. And so she gets to that place where she simply just says yes to God. And this simplicity is not anything shallow. It's not anything that represents a lack of substance. No, there was something very real in Mary that was a childlike kind of faith, and a childlike faith is always pleasing to God, that when we come to God like a little child, there's a blessing that flows to us because of that. And so there was humility and there was simplicity. Do you have humbleness of heart? Do you have a simple relationship with God that you don't make it complex? And then there was availability. Yes, Mary was available. God knew Mary's heart. He knew that, 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 that she was available to him and, and she was available to whatever he wanted to do in her life and whatever he wanted to do through her life. As we talked about a moment ago, when it comes to the end of that encounter, she says, may it be unto me according to your word. I am the Lord's servant. And so she has this idea, this concept or gra grasped deeply inside of her that there's humility and there is a sense of simplicity, but there's also a sense of availability. God, I simply want to be be available to whatever you have for me. It's wonderful that when we come to God with that simple availability, how much God can do in our lives. And then the fourth characteristic that you see in Mary is responsiveness. She responds. She's quick to respond. That word responsive is a very important word because responsive means that you're quick to say yes to God. You're quick to respond to him. You don't procrastinate or you don't fight with God and you don't, you don't rebel or resist God's work in your life. And Mary had that, that simplicity, yes, but also that responsiveness that whenever God said, I've chosen you to be the bearer of my son and bring my, 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 my Messiah into the world, there was this response of, of yes, God, whatever you want to, to, to do in my life, may it be unto me according to to your word. Mary possessed these qualities. If you and I are going to change into the person that God wants us to be, we have to believe that God's plans are better than our plans, and we have to also possess some characteristics. We need to develop our humility and our simple relationship with God and our availability to God and our responsiveness to him, that we don't live our lives in stubbornness and resistance and fighting with God, but instead, yes, Lord, whatever you desire in my life. There's a third thing that I want you to note from Mary's story here that's so vital to us as well, that Mary gave God her full attention. And if you and I are going to experience the change that's necessary in our lives, we also have to give God our full attention. We have to really listen to God. See, there are a lot of voices in the world around us or voices that we have in our own heads and voices in the world around us and our media is always screaming certain voices at us. And so in the midst of all these voices, we have to tune out the voices that are not of God and tune in the voices that are, are of God. And that's a, that's a process. That's something that you and I need to do. We need to give God our full attention. And in that moment, when the angel showed up in Mary's life, it was a full attention moment. Look at, again at what happens here in verses 28 through 33 of Luke chapter 1. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary was listening attentively to that declaration of the angel Gabriel, the messenger angel from God. And God got Mary's attention through the angel Gabriel. And she was listening well. Mary was ready to listen. Her ears were tuned. Think of the opportunity that Mary would have missed had she been distracted or had she been preoccupied with her own plans and sort of shoved off the angelic vision and said, I I'm not going to listen to this. I have my own plans. I I'm going to push God away. What if she'd refused to listen? It would have been a sad situation for Mary. 
The same is true for us that God has a desire to help us to understand what he wants to do in our lives, but we have to be listening. Now, I'll tell you this, you shouldn't be expecting God to send Gabriel to you. Mary had this unique experience. We don't need a Gabriel to come to us to hear God. In fact, it's vital to recognize that you don't need an angelic host to show up at your house for God to be able to speak into your life. God wants to speak into your life on a daily basis, guiding and directing your life in a very significant way, but oftentimes not in some kind of sort of uh, extraordinary way, but it's, it's sort of a regular way of interacting with you and your relationship with Him. How does that happen? Well, God speaks to you when you open up your Bible each day and you begin to read and you ask God to take his word and apply it to your heart. You're praying over scripture and God begins to help you to see something from his word that is there to adjust and to direct your life. God speaks to you through the preaching and teaching of his word. For example, for some of you here this weekend, as you're listening to my voice, God is speaking certain things to you. He's highlighting things in your life right now. God speaks to you sometimes through circumstances and through the mature people that will help you in your journey with God. And you and I need to discover the plan of God, but we do so by by listening. And God wants to speak into your life. Again, it does not have to be in some extraordinary, phenomenal way like Mary experienced, but in the simple ways of studying your Bible and listening to the teaching and preaching of God's Word and taking a look at what God's doing in your life and surrounding yourself with the right people in your life. All those things are vital to letting God's voice become very real to you, but you need to give God your full attention. You know, you'll never understand any, any communication from someone unless they have your full attention. It's very easy to misunderstand when someone doesn't have full attention focused on a, on a conversation. I don't know how many times my wife and I have been in a, in a room together. Maybe I've been watching, a, maybe I'm watching television or maybe I'm engaged in reading or whatever it might be. And she's carrying on a conversation with me or at least attempting to do so. And I'll say yes to something or respond in a certain way. And then later she will remind me that I said yes to something I don't even remember. She didn't have my full attention. And so it's only when there's a full attention that there can be good communication, good conversation and good results. And so the question becomes for us, if we want to change, we need to give God our full attention. Can I ask you this weekend, does God have your full attention? Do you believe that God's plans are, are better than yours? Are you seeking to develop the characteristics in your life that will help you to be changeable, those characteristics of humility and simplicity and availability and responsiveness to God? And are you giving God your full attention? The last thing I want to talk about for the next few moments is I want to talk about the value of us cooperating with God's process of change. It's a very important statement there, God's process of change. Remember this. God never changes, but God wants us to change. Everybody is a believer And all of us as people who are trying to respond to God, there are changes that are needed in our life. It's called growth. And you'll never grow without changing. If you take a look at any plant that's growing, it changes. It changes from the time of being a little seedling that comes up out of the ground until the time that actually bears fruit. It looks different. It it performs differently. There's changes that go on. And the same is true for you. To bear fruit for Christ, you're going, and I'm going to have to continually change. It's called sanctification. It's called growing in Christ. And that change process is a process. It would be wonderful if just all of a sudden God could sort of sort of slap us on the head and and, and, and in a moment all the changes that were necessary in our life were made and we're absolutely perfect. That's not how it works. It works in relationship with Him and it works as a process over a period of time. I want to draw your attention for a few moments away from Mary, and let's go to Joseph for a moment, because just like Mary had to discover the need for change in her life from changing her plans to God's plans, Joseph had to do the same. Joseph had to experience a process of change in his life and a changing of his mind and a changing of his thinking. In Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, we see what transpires with Joseph. Joseph, her fiancé, Mary's fiancé, was a good man, did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Let me stop there for, for a moment. At some point, obviously, Mary, after saying yes to God, is, is impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
She's a virgin and yet conceives a child by God's grace and God's working and by God's power. She is now pregnant, carrying the very Son of God. And of course, she has to communicate this to her fiance that she is pregnant, that she is expecting a child. And of course, all that Joseph could understand in his natural thinking was something had transpired outside of their, their, their relationship. And so he, he, he thinks that, you know, the best thing I can do is just sort of help her to be put away privately. And I'm not here to embarrass her in any way. I just, I just, I just need to deal with this quietly and, 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 and just let it be what it's going to be and move on with my life and allow Mary to move on with her life. That's how he was thinking. And so he's thinking about this. He's considering this. Verse number 20, as he considered this, that is, he's thinking about this plan he has in his mind. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So God shows up while he's thinking about how to handle this situation. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So there's this moment that, the, that God comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, look, let me clear things up for you. I know what it looks like and what it appears to be is not what it really is. You think it's one thing, but I want you to know God says it's actually something else. And so this child she's carrying has been conceived by the Holy Spirit and she will have a son and you're to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. So here's this message of the angel now coming to Joseph. He's got to process all of this. What's he going to do? Remember, he's, he's been considering how to just sort of end the relationship quietly, and now he has this message from God that, in fact, that the child she's bearing has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. What, what is he going to do? How, how is he going to respond? Notice verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. Here's such a vital lesson for us. While Joseph Joseph was thinking one way in his own natural thinking, very good man, the Bible says he was righteous, he was trying to do the right thing in this situation, But in the midst of his struggle, in the midst of his consideration of what to do with Mary, having learned that she was pregnant, God showed up and God changed his mind. It is so valuable for each one of us to realize that sometimes our minds have to be changed. And your mind, as goes your mind, so goes your life. Joseph changed his mind and it changed his actions. You will never have life change without mind change. You will never have behavioral change without thinking change. The only change that can ever occur in your life starts in your thinking. And in these these few brief moments with God, this short encounter that Joseph had with him, Joseph's, Joseph's mind changed. And because Joseph's mind changed, his plans changed and his life changed. So I want to talk to us as we're wrapping up today's message about how do you go through the process of having your mind changed. What is that all about? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that we're to be renewed by the transformation of our minds, by the renewal of our minds, that our minds are changed. How does that happen? What is this process? Because again, Joseph experienced change in his life, but it started with this thinking. It started with this consideration. So let me share with you some some things that are vital. and These are on your notes. I hope you'll just follow along closely as I wrap up today's message with seven things that are essential. If God's going to do the change in your life that is, that, that is necessary, it starts obviously with believing that God's plan is better than yours. It involves the whole process of developing certain characteristics in your life, humility and simplicity and availability and, and, re- and responsiveness to God. It involves a variety of different things in your life that are so vital, coming to that place of giving God your full attention. But then there's this process of changing your thinking that is so vital. So here are, here are seven things that will help you to begin that process of change in your thinking that will move you forward in the will and purpose of God for your life. Number one, you have to examine your thoughts. 
And you and I can't examine our thoughts by ourselves. We need God's help. And so one of the prayers that I would encourage you to pray and one of the prayers that, that I often will pray is, God, would you, would you look on the inside of me and help me to see how I'm thinking so I, I'll understand that my thoughts, I understand what my thoughts really are because, you know, you, you, most of us uh, can confuse ourselves with our own thinking. We don't even know how we're thinking because it's all hidden inside of us. And so we need God to help us to examine our thoughts. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 27, verse to examine me, O Lord, and test me. Look closely into my heart and mind. It's very important that we say, God, would you help me to recognize how I'm thinking? See, Joseph didn't even realize he was thinking the wrong way about the situation until God showed up. Oftentimes, we don't even realize how how off we are and the way we're thinking about certain things until God helps us and God helps us to see how we're thinking and the thought patterns that are ruling and guiding our lives. And so it's a prayer. We say, God, would you help me to see my thinking patterns? Would you help me to, to, to understand what's going on inside of my own head? And then number two, we need to open our mind to, to God's truth and God's will. The word open means that you have no barriers, <clears throat> that you don't have any restrictions that you're in this place of adjustment, you're willing to be adjusted. See, when, when something is open, you don't have to push your way through. And so it's sort of like I was talking about a few moments ago, giving God full, your full attention. Well, you give God full access. Lord, I'm opening my mind to your truth, and I'm opening my mind to your will. It's another prayer that the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my mind and let me discover the wonders of your law. God, I'm asking you, yes, to examine my mind, help me to know what I'm thinking, and then open my mind and let me discover the wonders of your law. And so there's this prayer that goes along with the first prayer, the examination and the opening up to what God wants to do in our hearts and minds. Then number three, you and I need to make sure that we cleanse our mind from sinful thoughts. The psalmist David prayed this prayer, create pure thoughts in me and make me faithful again. That's Psalm 51, verse number 10 from the contemporary English version. Create pure thoughts in me and make me faithful again. So Lord, I'm asking you to examine my thoughts and I'm asking you to open up my mind to understand what your, your way is and what your will is. And God, by the way, before I even go any further, would you, would you wash my mind of anything that's, that's contaminated there? So you would never take fresh, clean water and pour it into a dirty glass, would you? No. Before you pour the water in, you clean the glass. It just makes sense, right? And the same is true if we want God to pour in fresh water, fresh understanding into our lives. We need to ask God to clean the glass, to wash out the container, to wash out our hearts, and to cleanse us from anything in our thinking that is, that's, that's impure, that's contrary to his holiness. And why is this important? Because God then can pour into a clean and pure vessel, but you and I need to prepare for that. How do you do that? You simply ask God to help you be aware of where you've missed the mark with him, and then you confess your sins. You confess to him whatever you need to confess to him and ask God to cleanse you. And I'm so grateful, as I'm sure you are, for the tremendous power of the blood of Jesus that washes us and cleanses us from the inside out. And then the fourth thing that's necessary, if you're going to hear God's voice and you have the changing of your thoughts in the way that they need to be changed, as you and I need to pray this prayer, God, would you heal my mind from diseased thoughts? Not only can we have impure thoughts in our minds, we can also have diseased thoughts. Diseased thoughts are not necessarily sinful thoughts, they're just dysfunctional thoughts, just thinking the wrong way. A lot of us have grown up in situations where we learn to think the wrong way, and so our minds are, are actually just, just dysfunctional, and so we think a certain way. We're controlled by fear, or controlled by, by insecurities, we're controlled by pride, we're controlled by a variety of different things that we learn to think certain ways, and so these things get inside of us, and they're, they've diseased us. I, I love this story of Jesus and how he ministered to a man who, is, who had, been, had been thinking the wrong way, influenced by a demonic spirit. We'll come to that more in just a moment. Moment. But look at Luke chapter 8, verse 35, the first part of verse 35. And people went to see what had happened. This is what happened to this man that Jesus delivered. When they came to Jesus, they found the man sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his, what kind of mind? His right mind, because the demons were gone. If he was now clothed and in his right mind, it means it was a particular time when he was in his wrong mind. And you and I can have diseased thoughts and Asking God to heal us from the wounds on the inside that cause our, our thinking to be dysfunctional. And then number five, we need to ask God to liberate our minds from any demonic thoughts. 
I don't want to scare you with this because there's nothing to be afraid of. It's very clear that, uh, that we have victory in Christ, but there is an adversary of our soul. The Bible says we're in spiritual warfare and we, we fight the enemy. There's a battle going on in the spiritual realm, the power of God's purpose and light and the works, the elements of darkness. And one of the ways the enemy gains access into our lives is by thoughts, by, by thoughts that are based upon lies and deceptions and things that we buy into that are contrary to God's word and God's ways. And so the adversary wants to get into our minds and build strongholds. And so we have to pray that God, by his power, by the victory that Jesus won on the cross of Calvary, will break those strongholds and deliver us from any holes of the adversary in our thinking. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, we do not live in the world, but we do fight. But we do live in the world. Let me start again. We do live in the world, but we do not fight in the same way the world fights. We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy enemy's strong places. We destroy people's arguments and every proud thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. We capture every thought. Where do thoughts happen in your mind? We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Christ. Here Paul is saying there's a battle that's going on and the battle is in your brain. The battle's in your mind. And so you have to learn how to use your spiritual authority to take those thoughts captive and say, no, these thoughts are of the adversary. They're not going to ru ruin or rule my life. And then the sixth thing that you have to do is learn to protect your mind from destructive thoughts. If you and I are going to change our minds so that we're living in line with God's word and God's will, we need to pray for protection against destructive thoughts that would come our way and ask God to help us to be delivered from those as, the, as, as Jesus taught us to pray, deliver us from the evil one in the great Lord's Prayer. Isaiah the prophet understood this as well in Isaiah 26, verse number three. Notice his words to us or his promise to us from God. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so we fix our thinking on Jesus. We fix our thoughts on him. And there is a protection from destructive thoughts. And then the last thing I want to mention this weekend is that we have to ask God to fill our mind with a love for him and a love for people I would, ask as, I would add as well. When you love God, you'll want to obey God. When you love Him, there'll be a desire to obey Him. And when you love God, you'll love other people. That's just the way it works. When Jesus was asked the question one day, what's the greatest commandment of all the commandments? What's the greatest thing we ought to focus on? And notice in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. Notice that. Love God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. And of course, he goes on to say the second is likened to this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So vital. So vital. The coming of Jesus Christ into the world changed Mary and changed Joseph. It changed the way they thought, it changed the way they lived, and it changed their destiny. During this Christmas season, I believe that God wants to speak very clearly and is speaking very clearly to you during this time that there's something more that he wants you to discover for your life. And that discovery really involves letting God change you. Believe, believe that God's plans are better than your plans. Become that person who is prepared to change. Say, God, I want to walk in humility with you. I want to walk in simplicity. I want to make this relationship with you all complex. I want to be like a child coming before you. And God, I want to just be available to you. And I want to be responsive. I don't want to fight with you, God. I want to be a, a person that responds with a yes to you. God, I want you to have my full attention. I don't want to be distracted by all the different voices that are coming my way. But I want to be tuned in to the voice of heaven. And God, whatever that process of change is for me, especially the changing of my, of my mind, God, would you help me to engage in that process with you and cooperate with you so that the changes you want to work in me are fulfilled in my life. Would you join together with me as we pray? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we've had this weekend to gather around your word. We're grateful for the great story of Mary and Joseph and the different things they discovered at that first Christmas. And thank you that they discovered the need for and the power of change in their life, the, the importance of being able to let you adjust them and change them and grow them into the destiny you had for them. And I pray that today, in Jesus' name, that you do the same for us. 
I pray, Lord, that where we've been fighting with you or battling with you in any way, I pray that we would surrender to you, even as Mary and Joseph did, that we would yield to your purposes and yield to your plans, that we would give you our full attention, God, that nothing else would distract us. And we pray, Lord, it would not just be for this moment and this season, but for the rest of our lives. We know that this is only possible through the grace and power of God, through the strength and grace and enabling of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, do this work, we ask. We surrender ourselves to you today in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. And you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus, I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.